Thanks so much. Um, it's really funny. This, this conference is very interesting. I have an interesting story to tell. I'm really humbled, really, to be here. Rails Conf... Chicago was the first one, right? Was the first conference I ever paid for. Um, but I didn't go. My lead developer, Eric Kastner, wanted to go so bad, so bad, I was like, shit, I have to send him. So he went and had a great time. And anybody's on Twitter right now, please hit up at Kastner and tell him I want to kiss his face because he's such a wonderful dude. Um, yeah, he's a good dude, but his beard. Anyway, um, yeah, this community's kind of near and dear to my heart. You know, I know that you guys bring out speakers sometimes that from the outside, I know Zay's spoken here and I know, I think Ferris might have spoke here last year and different, different things of that nature. So, you know, I can't develop shit. I, I can't do that. That's not really what I know. But what's interesting is that out of all the platforms, this one ha- kind of hits a very deep and soft spot in my heart. Real quick before I go into that because I just want to paint the context for you. How many of you know who I am or somewhat about me? Raise your hand. How many don't? Devastating. <laughs> no, but actually I kind of figured that was the case. I've been lucky. I've been speaking a lot of places where I haven't had to give the history lesson. I apologize for some of you that know it, but I'll just give you three minutes of where I come from so you understand why I'm standing here and then I'll get into my spiel. And also, more importantly, I have no interest in standing up here and bragging about what I've done. I'd much rather do Q&A. So I know it's like the end and I know you gotta get up and get in line, but it would mean so much to me. And I was talking to Chad. Chad's giving $200 cash to anybody who asks a question while I'm up here. It's so nice of you, man. <laughs> you are so awesome. Let's hear it for Chad, come on. Huge. You're the best fucking dude ever. I've got a question. <laughs> Absolutely. I was born in Belarus in the former Soviet Union and uh, I came here in 1978 when I was three. Um, we were very poor. My dad had a great uncle who was gonna kind of take care of us but it took nine months to get from former Soviet to the US, all the paperwork and the bullshit, retina scan, all that. So we had to stay in Italy for six months while our visas got processed and while we were there, this great uncle passed away. So now we come to America, it's the next generation under him, which is like my dad's second cousin removed all that horse shit and you know, we're like the long lost relatives from Russia. We show up and we're like, hey, we're here. They had very little interest seeing our faces. But they were were good and they kind of helped out as much as they could but we moved into a studio apartment in Queens in 78, literally, literally slightly smaller than this stage and I lived with eight of my family members and it was pretty ghetto and old school and uh, it was tough, it was super tough but my dad got a job at a liquor store in Clark, New Jersey and he lived in Queens and I still bust my dad's chops because I say that he spent more money on gas than he did actually getting paid. But we kind of saved up, did our thing, my dad eventually became the manager of that store. We moved to the Dirty Jersey, as I like to call it, Edison, New Jersey and, um, and you know, he became eventually the manager. We saved every dollar, didn't buy anything, and eventually he became part owner, and that's kind of how this all started. I, on the other hand, was outrageously entrepreneurial. When I was six, I had seven lemonade stands. My friends ran them. I was not gonna be a cashier. I was marketing. (laughs) I always say, you know, I talk a lot about television and the web, and I always say we're in the eyeballs and ears business. So I was like, we're in the eyeballs business, and it hit me, I forgot this. I was trying to remember what I did when all my friends were tied up running lemonade stands and I remembered that I made all the signs and really wildly I used to walk on the streets that the cars were, well not in the street, on the sidewalk and try to figure out where literally I would sit like on a grassy knoll and just watch every single person driving's face and try to figure out where their eyes went so I knew which tree or pole to put the sign on. So I've always been outrageously interested in like habits. So the lemonade thing did really well but then I really blew the fuck up in eighth grade when I started a baseball card business and I completely dominated. I was making like $1,500 to $2,000 a weekend selling baseball cards in the mall of of New Jersey. Which when you're 13 and you have six G's you know under your bed you know and you're not selling weed you're doing awesome. (laughs) So so that was awesome and I was crushing it. Oh crap, I told that bingo guy I wouldn't say it once. Fuck! <laughs> so pissed. Um, that I definitely will say. 
especially since we're in Baltimore and we're gonna kick the Ravens' ass in the first game of the year this year. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but we stole all your shit, right? Sorry, getting nerdy with Jets, I apologize. Anyway, <laughs> then my dad ruined my life. I was doing all this stuff, it was awesome, and at 14, first generation immigrant, oldest son, pops, drags my ass into the liquor store, and pays me two bucks an hour to bag ice for 10 hours a day in the basement. That blew, and you know, I mean, I was making 20 bucks a day instead of making two Gs. I was either in the mall with my friends and girls and being a boss and selling Frank Thomas rookie cards like it was my job, or I was in the basement like I was fucking sloth from the Goonies bagging ice. (laughs) Hey, you guys, I mean, it was terrible. So finally at 16 though, I was able to come upstairs and my life changed very, very quickly. After bagging ice and, you know, dusting shelves, there was one very famous day where every customer, and Wine Library at the time called Shoppers Discount Liquors, was in the Short Hills, Milburn area of New Jersey. So it was an affluent area, but we were very much a liquor and beer store. But literally all, I would say 40 people came in that day asking for Camus Special Select 1990 Cabernet. And finally like the 17th person I was like, dude, you know, I'm gonna take a back order. We didn't have back orders, but I was like, fuck this, I'm taking one. So I was like, I'll take a back order. You know, what's your name, what's your address, how much wine do you want? He's like, well, I'll take four cases. I was like, fuck, this guy's an alcoholic. (laughs) That was a lot. And I was like, four cases, are you having a party? And he was like, no, 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 I collect wine. And literally, literally guys, at that exact moment, I was like, because I wanted to help my family business, because like any punk kid entrepreneur 16 years old, I thought everything my dad was doing was wrong. But it was so boring, I wasn't a normal high school kid, I didn't give a crap about drinking beer or liquor or Zima, which was ripping hot at the time. And <laughs> pop that Jolly Rancher in there. Um, right? Um, so the wine thing was interesting. Right at that moment I was like, collect wine? I was like, shit. Gretzky, Michael Jordan, Frank Thomas, Opus One, Silver Oak, same shit, I can do this. And so literally that's what attached me, that people collected wine. So literally right there in the middle of the store when I was 16, I was like, I'm gonna be the greatest wine guy of all time. That's literally what I wanna do for my life. That's it, because school sucks, fuck that, and this is what I'm gonna do. So I started reading about wine in an insane level. And even though my parents are Eastern European, we owned a liquor store, they would not let me drink anything. So I read for five years, knew all this stuff, Launched winelibrary.com. I wanted to change the name of our business. I hated Shoppers Discount Liquors. We were part of a co-op, even though we were all separate stores, so everybody had different type of stores. I felt that our brand was getting hurt by other stores that sucked. So the web was my outlet. You know, in 97, I launched winelibrary.com, and, uh, and that's kind of where it started. And from 1998 to 2005, when I ran Wine Library day to day in that seven year window, I grew our family business from a three to a $60 million a year business. So that was good, and family was happy, and things were great. In 2001, I met Eric Kastner, which is pretty much brings me into this world. I decide, you, <laughs> I wish you guys could, you think some videos are out there are funny? I wish I taped the conversation between my dad and I when I tried to convince him to hire Eric that we, a liquor store, needed a full-time developer. That was some <laughs> funny shit. <laughs> that you would have liked with my dad's break, broken English with, no fucking way. <laughs> I'm like, dad, I will give up all my salary to hire him. Because I knew, I knew this was where it was going, I was pumped about it. Eric came on board, which was great, and you know, that started, you know, the first day was awesome. I think it was, uh, it was actually right after September 11th, so he started full, full time in 2002. First day walks in, I'm searching Yahoo, he's like, dude, check out this Google thing. I'm like, all right, typed in Google, I'm like, Eric, this is so stupid. How are they gonna make money? It's a blank fucking page, idiots. (laughs) That was, you know, now that I predict things in social commentate, I'm like, whew, thank God those early first four or five years I wasn't taping, I'd be long gone. You would have loved my doozy on how frugal was gonna change the world. Um, I built my library's entire business model, by the way, on frugal, and now finally Red Laser is here. It's like a decade later, but it's still not really where I think it will be. Anyway, so Eric comes, learn all this stuff, and you know, we, we grow Wine Library. I start hearing about all these different names, blogging, all that stuff, and, um, and then I turned 30 in 2005, and I'm driving from Manhattan to New Jersey, which is where Wine Library is, and somewhere around the New Jersey Turnpike, 
I decided that for the first time ever in my life, I wasn't 100% happy. I was like 97. And what I realized was this. Wine Library is not as big as it could be because I can't ship to Boston, I can't ship to Maryland, I can't ship to Mass. All these bullshit, motherfucking bullshit, bullshit ass, bullshit liquor laws in our country. <laughs> yeah, clap that shit up, fuckers. So I was like, fuck, this should have been like, you know, way bigger. I'm losing my prime years. I'm 30 now. It can't be bullshitting. I, I want to buy the New York Jets. There's no way I'm getting to a billion selling wine, so I got to do something about it. So I decided, ironically, right in that moment, that was the summer when Eric, and now we had a couple other developers, all they did was watch Zay Frank. And I looked at Zay and I was like, I could do that fucking shit, you know? And so they were like, no, you can't. Zay's the shit. I'm like, fuck those ducks. I was like, I'm going to do this. So, and Zay's the best. And so I, uh, I decided that I was going to start a wine show. I was going to go super narrow. So I launched Wine Library TV in February 2006. And the first month I did Wine Library TV, full month, March of 2006, um, was the first time in 96 straight months that Wine Library did not grow 20% against the year before sales. The first time. From the day I took over operations, we grew at least 20% or more, usually 40 or 50, compared to the year before's numbers for that month. And that kind of was a culture shock in my building, and that continued. I hustled WLTV for 18 months without giving a shit about anything. I did it every day, taped it 30 minutes a day, and more importantly, spent 15 hours a day going to wine blogs and forums and talking about what I gave a fuck about. Because the happiness was so much dramatically more important to me than what was happening with dollars and cents. Everybody in the building thought I lost my fucking mind. But I was so ridiculously happy being in the community of what I loved. And so that was really exciting for me. That was a great, great time. Then Time Magazine wrote a piece, excuse me, New York Magazine wrote a piece that led to Joel Stein from Time Magazine seeing it, wrote an amazing piece that led to the Conan O'Brien producers uh, finding out about me, emailed me. I thought it was my friends playing a joke on me. They're like, we want you on Conan. I was like, sure. Went on there. We ate dirt, grass. Millions of people saw it. That's when the web started really seeing what I was doing. And it kind of took off from there. You know, just in the you know, next day, I got all these you know, Hollywood agencies wanting to sign me. I signed with CAA. So I'm rep by the same people that rep Oprah and Beckham and Derek Jeter. It's some crazy ass shit. And so... That went well and I've been pitched a lot of TV, but then what started happening in the height of all this, I wanted to talk about the other thing and probably what I wanted to spend the rest of the time talking with you guys about is I just love business and marketing and building things I love and supporting them and the communities behind it. So I started blogging under my own name, GaryVaynerchuk.com, right in the height of all my wine madness, just talking about some of the things I see, the trends, things I believe in, and uh, that led to a lot of opportunity. I've spoken to a lot of conferences and I wrote a book last year called Crush It and did really, really well. And I'm writing a new book right now and I kind of want to talk a little bit about that and I want to get to Q&A called The Thank You Economy. The new book I'm writing called The Thank You Economy is really taking a look at you know, customer service, you know, the social media debate. You know, it's so funny to me. I started a consulting company last year, some of you might know, called VaynerMedia with my brother AJ. And all my friends are like, what the fuck is he doing? You know, it's not a scalable product. Kind of weird left turn for him. But I think a lot of people in this space, um, and just in business in general, really lack understanding that we're all running a marathon. There, almost everybody I see in, in the web space, so many people are all running sprints. It's like everybody's running a company like they're a 19 year old dude. All they want to do is close fast, which is interesting. And I agree, thank you for that one clap, that meant a lot to me. I'm serious, because it's serious, because I'm dead serious. This shit is so obnoxiously early. I mean, YouTube just celebrated its fifth birthday. I mean, the, the consumer internet that we're all built, fuck Twitter and Facebook and all the other things, we're building on the web or whatever, the consumer web or whatever you want to call it, the internet, I always get yelled at for this stuff, but whatever it is, it's only been 15, 16 years since AOL spammed our actual mailboxes trying to get us online. I mean, the fucking internet hasn't had sex yet and it's dominating. <laughs> I mean, this is ridiculously early. I, I really hope that we're painting that context here. This stuff is crazy early. This is just starting. And the problem is everybody just wants to sell and close and nobody's paying attention to building long-term real relationships. When we all look back 
at the Zappos acquisition by Amazon, everybody's gonna recognize how ridiculously smart Bezos is. They fucking stole Zappos at 1.3 billion. I know a lot of people that thought that it was a, a, you know, a ridiculous thing to pay for a shoe company. They were outselling Amazon on certain products when they were more expensive. They were beating them on culture. We buy for different reasons today. Things are shifting and it, convenience is obviously dramatically important to us. But giving a fuck is coming on strong. And the fact of the matter is, you like that? Yeah. Should I change the title to the giving a fuck economy? This is a good test case. Yeah. Harper Collins will kick my face in. Um, we'll try to see what they say. Um, it's really coming, guys, listen. We're living in the first time ever where you can scale your caring. The fact that I'm interacting with people that give a crap about what I do while I'm taking a shit at three o'clock in the morning on my laptop is amazing. <laughs> I mean, it is. I mean, you know, we, we're, co- you like that? <laughs> Thanks, man. I'm gonna use, use that one again, got it. Um, I, I just really think it's fascinating. Like, I'm one dude, and yes, I have outrageous energy, and yes, I'm ridiculously handsome and charismatic, I get it. <laughs> but, but, it's so fascinating. AJ and I consult for the National Hockey League, Campbells, Cadbury, the Jets. It's an inside thing, I'm trying to figure out how to buy them. Um, you know, and a lot of big companies, and they always tell me, like, how do we, how do we, you know, I'm like, so I come in, I'm like, listen, here's the eight trillion conversations going around your brand right now on Twitter, on Facebook, whatever other platform, Tumblr, whatever it may be. I'm like, you need to conversate. This is happening with or without you. Get in there and become part of this and not just putting out fires. It is time for our entire space to stop using these platforms just to put out fires. How about saying thank you? How about when somebody's giving you daps that you like pat them on the ass virtually? You know, like, you know, how about that? I mean, it is an absolute dream for businesses, a lot of what I've always loved about this space in a big way is, yes, I'm not a developer, but a lot of the people, and I know a lot of people in this room, most of you are, but I also know that a lot of people are building products, building small businesses. There's always been a really fascinating, passionate, entrepreneurial vibe to this space to me. And so the fact that people talk about your products, that is so important. I mean, I listen to people say, well, I don't have enough scale yet. If one person, follows you and gives a crap about what you say, you should be ridiculously thankful. I'm serious. I mean, that is right. I mean, that's incredible. I'm blown away that 850,000 people follow me on Twitter and give a crap enough. That that freaks with my brain on such a level like you, I'm so grateful, so grateful. And companies and people need to start getting grateful, not chasing fucking numbers. And while I'm on this kick, if you allow me for two seconds, I really just want to riff on one thing. Can we please collectively as a space punch the people directly in their fucking mouths when they say things like, if I get 100 more followers, I'll donate $100 to Haiti. Hey, fuck face, just donate the $100 to Haiti. (laughs) And you guys, and you guys code and shit. I can only just go at them one by one. I don't know how to scale and just say fuck you. So please, if you see those guys, make some code shits happen. Like put some JSON and some HTML5 on their asses and fuck with them, please. Fuckers. I hate that. You know how I say hate? I don't know, I'm going in a weird direction. I apologize. These fucking Facebook privacy peeps. Listen, I respect privacy and all that, but you know who I'm really pissed at? The 800 people I saw for the last month try to game the Facebook situation and say, I'm quitting Facebook and here's my page for it and here's my blog post. The only reason they did that was to get exposure, to leverage the story and hope they might get an article in the Wall Street Journal or Newsweek or something like that. Because I'll tell you right now, of the 800, and I marked them all down as I saw it and put them in a nice little bucket on the left side, 799 of them are using Facebook right now. So they're full of fucking shit and more importantly, What I think people need to recognize is everything you're doing is being documented. My great, great grandkids are watching this right now. Hey, Jeremiah. I think you have my DNA. Please, if I didn't buy the Jets, please execute that for me. Thank you. The fact that that just happened, and the best part is my great, great grandson or daughter is gonna be like, my name's not fucking Jeremiah. I'm not a fucking Notre Dame, I'm sorry. But, 
Everything you do, every way you interact with every customer, every product you build, everybody you retweet, everybody you support, everybody you're giving a quote to for their book, the forward, anybody and everything you're doing in today's world is being documented and you are writing your legacy right now. So please, to not embarrass yourself in your future family, give some thought to the dumb gaming shit like that $100 Haiti thing or when you want to play the Facebook card because you want to get some attention for 40 seconds and then you're a hypocrite 13 minutes later. Think about what you're doing because I promise you right now, there's probably about 13 to 15 people and I'm not exaggerating the number, that's the right number. Right now, I don't think they're bad people but I definitely think differently of them. You know, I think like you're just, you know, it's all short term. And so I think, you know, I'm just so fascinated by this world we live in now that where I feel like the truth is undefeated. You know, like it's just getting real hard to hide. You know, it's get, you know, look at the new iPhone. So you go to Vegas, like maybe you did for RailsConf the other year, right? And you know, you call your girlfriend, like, yeah, baby, I'm just playing werewolf after RailsConf. She's like, yeah, put on your eye check. Oh shit, Spearmint Rhino. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, you can't hide anymore. The world is changing and I think we have to really adjust to the real reality of our world and I for one am thrilled with that because listen, I'm very aware of my DNA. I am absolutely positive that people in this crowd right now before this talk and maybe after this talk think I'm a douchebag or I'm too over the top or I'm full of shit or it's too much self-promotion. I get all that. I respect it to no end. I'm very self-aware. I've got East Coast flavor for East Coast people. It's intensity. I get, you like that? Oh, this is going over better than I thought, thank you. Like, I, I get it, and you know what? I respect it. I interact, you know, the, the 27 negative reviews I have on Amazon, every one of those people have gotten a response, and I appreciate it, I get it. We need to respect each other's thoughts. We do, you have to become more self-aware, as, we have to become more self-aware as people, and we definitely have to become self-aware about our products, because a lot of our products have holes, and there's things that, you know, we need to fix, and I think this combative nature, or going like this, Oh, that's good, um, is, is not going to help anybody. And I think we need to really respect and understand that that's just the way it's going to be. And I think it lends itself to a very, very good situation long term. I'm excited about it. I know at the end of the day, one by one, until I fucking die, I will scale every relationship I can and communicate with people as much as I can, respect their thoughts on me, and I know it works. Because if you can show people who you are, if you can actually give a crap enough, this economy of, I know people who are like, Gary, it's so weird who you, somebody sent me an email yesterday, he's like, Gary, I was analyzing how you use Twitter, it's like, it's weird, you know, I only reply to people that have a thousand followers or more, you're replying to people that have like three and shit, like, where, what's the strategy? I'm like, so my reply was like, dear Tim, here's the strategy, you're a fucking asshole and I'm a good guy. <laughs> that was really the answer. He wrote back, um, this is true, he wrote back, no seriously, and I wrote back, no fucking seriously. (laughs) I was like, dick, you know, there was, (laughs) sorry, I need, (sighs) hold on. (laughs) Who did I talk to outside that said I wasn't gonna curse? (laughs) Are you in here? Didn't work out, yeah man, sorry. Um, We are living, (sighs) do you know who I feel bad for? I feel bad for every one of us in here, our version, who was us two generations ago that didn't have the freedom to build the kind of things we want. The people that couldn't, you know, you know, practicality is something I believe in so much. You know, this isn't any like secret shit. I don't believe like you think it's gonna happen and it happens. I mean, you've gotta work your face off. It's all about the hustle. The fact that we can work our nine to fives or our nine to sevens, come home, you know, hang out a little bit with our families and then work, you know, from 11 p.m. to 3 in the morning. Building the shit we love is such a special thing. And I feel awful for every entrepreneur or engineer that came before us because what we're living through right now is ridiculously awesome. And we should be ridiculously thankful for it. And our awareness about this, I think, is very much under the radar. I come from a place, and man, I'll tell you right now, people always ask me, like, dude, what are you, like a Cokehead or a Red Bull? How could you have so much energy? I'm like, I am so over the top driven by gratitude. The amount of self esteem that my mom put in my body should be illegal. <laughs> the fact that my dad, at 14 years old, taught me that saved my ass. 
Because, you know, I'm a storyteller, schmoozer kind of character. I would have liked to fudge numbers and things like that. Now it saves me in this very transparent world. And that combo of parents that were very different has allowed me an amazing opportunity. The love they gave me, the opportunity they gave me, and the fact that I was born in a very bad place. Belarus is still the worst of the former Soviet unions. They have dictatorship. I can't go back to where I was born because they Google everybody and I'm an idiot and throw out all these numbers and they would have figured it out and they'd kidnap my ass and I'd be done. I mean, I can't go there. We are so lucky to be here and to be living during this platform shift. This is the greatest culture shift of our time. We are, this is, I'm promising you, we are dramatically underestimating what's happening right now. The opportunity we have and how we're going about doing this and the barriers that are being broken. The gatekeepers controlled the game forever. Guys, I have been offered 40 television sh- shows. Why? Because I, at my home, well, at Wine Library, which was my home, was able to tape a show using a $500 camera, now it can be even less than that, and putting it on a service that allowed it to be free, YouTube and then Viddler, and was able to go through all the gatekeepers. No dick face in LA decided that I had the goods. I didn't have to move to California, which I never would have done because I love my family too much, and yet, because the gatekeepers have lost the keys, I was able to go direct to consumer, build brand equity, and build every opportunity that I have today, which are massive and make me happy as shit, and the fact of the matter is, I'm not as special as some may think. Every single person here has that playing field, and that is the luckiest thing that has ever happened, period. You guys talk too much in the beginning. You cut into my fucking time. Hey, so a couple other things I want to talk about while, while we're, um, we're all here and hanging out. A um, couple trends that I'm really passionate about. One, I've been thinking a lot about freemium lately, right? I mean, this is a conversation, this is nothing new, but here's the difference. I think if you're building products, I hope that you're debating freemium in a very substantial way because I think that Apple has fundamentally created a, a unique opportunity for us I think because of the app culture, we are now seeing a huge push towards people accepting paying three bucks, four bucks, seven bucks, and I'm very fascinated by the consumers that, you know, all I really think about is culture and shifts and these kind of things, and I think right now, we're at the beginning of a real opportunity to really monetize building platforms, products, small aspects, because people are buying these apps, and we're not as comfortable necessarily maybe buying them from a website, though smart people like DHH and Freed and those guys have been long playing this game and many other people have, I think right now there is a substantial culture shift that is a much bigger wave to people paying for product and I hope that people are looking at what's going on with these apps, especially with the iPad, because the iPad feels a whole lot more like a computer to the normal consumer than an iPhone and so this app culture is a humongous positive for this global space and I'd like you to give it some thought. The other thing that I'm really and by the way, I want to get into Q&A now, so if you're interested in asking a question about anything I talked about or anything else, please line up now. 200 bones. <laughs> the other thing um, I want to talk about, are you guys going to be ridiculously over the top lazy and not ask questions? Thank you so much. Um, I'll get to you in a minute. <laughs> I promise. Actually, you know what? Fuck that. Go ahead. <laughs> Customer service, baby. This is awesome. Thank you. Thanks, man. What's your All name? Ron. Ronnie? Ron. Ronnie's Ron, good. Sorry. I like Ronnie. Ronnie's good? You're my man. Ronnie, Gary, baby. could you explain what you meant by what you, were you basically saying that freemium is bogus or were you, no. and we need to charge money? Tie it all in together for me, Yeah, please. sure, I'm sorry if I didn't paint it clearly. Thanks for coming to the talk, guys, that are leaving. Stay well. <laughs> Bye, darling. Um, no, I think freemium is huge. I think you get them in, you let them try it, whether it's trial or you have you know, a certain amount, you can do a certain amount of it. Listen, guys, let's open up the debate. It'd be really interesting if Twitter you know, launched under this kind of umbrella. If you remember 06, late 05, it was free 24-7, 365. I mean, that's just the way it was. It'd be really fascinating to me to see if Twitter said, you, well, you can have 400 friends for free, but it's nine bucks a year if you want more. Really curious, now that ship has sailed and a lot of people are sitting right now saying, oh, I wouldn't have paid it, or, or maybe you're saying you would have paid it, I'm not quite sure. It's tough for you to answer properly because the context has already been set and you've already used it under preconceived notions. But what would Twitter look like today if they were making nine bucks per user of everybody who has more than 400 fans? I think they'd be 
a little bit more viable of business. I still think there's other ways and I understand that the hockey stick growth might have not happened as easily and I can, I remember Jaiku and, and Pounce and there was other competitors, I get it, I remember. But you know, I think it should be debated and I think right now, more so, I think what 37S did was harder because there was such a culture of free. I think the apps right now, see, here's the thing. I get out of inside baseball. Way too many people in our space are so inside baseball. We all live in our fucking bubble. I like to talk to people that have no fucking idea what Foursquare Gawalor is, you know? And I think that they're interesting to me because they are now being trained. The masses, not the 87 of us. I'm talking the rest of the fucking thing. They're being trained to pay for shit and I think it's our time to strike. Okay, thanks a lot, man. No worries, man. I love you, Ronnie. Hey, man. Hey there. Um, What's your name? My name is Tamar. Tamron? So, no, it's like hammer with a T. Dammer? <laughs> hammer. T, Tamar, got it. I still so, think I have it. Um, Fuck. Go so ahead. This microphone's pretty loud. So when you're talking about larger companies engaging with all the conversations that are going on yes. in the community, how do you tell them to do this and still maintain honesty and sincerity and that sort of thing? Do you, do you even think that's possible? That's a really good question, dude. So, I'm gonna go over to Rail. Um, <laughs> it's RailsConf. Um, most companies right now, bro, the answer is no. You know why? Because they're dickheads. You know, all they really care about is bottom line and ROI, and it's been stunning to me going into the corporate world, how little emotion or giving any kind of crap to the consumer there really is. It's even worse than I think we think, right? That being said, you have breakthroughs, you have companies. I've been blown away by Campbell's, this 100 plus year iconic, you know, old school, I mean, they're fucking old school. You know, can you edit that? I'm gonna get in trouble. And so, <laughs> they, um, they wanna go there. Like, you know, it's, it's really gonna always be the DNA of the CEO. It's just the way it is. It trickles down from the top. You know, if everybody's scared that the CEO is numbers driven, then that's what it's gonna be and they're gonna try to run the bullshit sprint and they're not gonna really give a shit about how your day is. They're saying hello to you because they wanna sell you a coupon on the back end. But if you could ever, God forbid, get there. If you could ever, it's all culture. It's all fucking culture. The only thing it is is culture. You know what I mean? You have to mean it. When I'm saying, yo, what's up? Or when I'm just searching, listen, I spent my life on surmise. Remember surmise? You know, which Twitter bought and now is their back end. All I did all day was search Chardonnay, Merlot, Cab Franc, and when I would see somebody say, you know, what Zin should I have tonight? I wouldn't, I'd look at, I'd click them and see where they lived. I didn't say, oh, you should have, you know, Turley's in, and ironically, I just did a show on it. Here's the link. I literally looked to where they live, and because I understood every store in the country, and though I know Wine Library beat the shit out of all of them, I would say to them, listen, from a convenience standpoint, you live not far from K&L Wines, you should go there and ask for, you know, Raffinelli, Martinelli, and Turley, right? That's real shit. Now then, hopefully, that honest, from the heart engagement led to them clicking my profile. They click it, they get to Wine Library TV. You have to have your home. Fuck this micro-blogging bullshit. You have to have a home, right? They went there and then, God forbid, if my content was good enough, because at the end of the day, I don't give a fuck what kind of marketing play you have. Content is always king, right? If my shit was good enough, no matter how nice I was, when they clicked to Wine Library TV, if I didn't know what I was talking about and it wasn't entertaining for them, then they'd be gone, right? But if I was strong, if it was good, then they would. And that's how I built my business and my brand. Because I knew that I was giving a great product and I knew that my 14 hours of sweat one by one, because remember, this is 06. Twitter was nothing. It was so small, I was getting little from that. I had to be in wine forums and wine blogs. I couldn't go to Facebook because I didn't want to be the creepy old guy peddling wine to the kids because it was still kind of college, <laughs> you know? So it was hard. I, I, punch these marketers in the face in these meetings because I'm like, it's so easy for you now. And assholes, you're a logo, so we can scale this. Let's hire 800 people to be behind this. You know, instead of buying $40,000 billboards that don't mean dick, because I don't know if you guys are watching, I don't know if you drive, but I'll tell you right now, I'm not a big fan of traditional media in a lot of ways to begin with, pricing wise, but anybody who's buying outdoor media needs to look inside their head because if you look at any drive, I'm scared to drive right now. They're not looking at the billboard. They're not even looking at the fucking road. They're texting. <laughs> I'm scared out there. So, you know, 
there's so much shit I want to talk about. Like now what I want to do, but I want to answer more questions because I don't have that much time. But then like I want to get into the ROI discussion. You know, everybody's like, what's the ROI in social media? Well, I don't know, fuck face. What's the ROI in having a real relationship? Meanwhile, you're paying for billboards that have 40,000 cars drive by and you're paying a price on that. Meanwhile, nobody's looking at it, but you're paying. Or when you buy a magazine ad, really? Because you're paying 1.3 million circulation. That's what you're getting paid for. That's your fucking impression price. Well, guess what? How do I know if somebody's going to page 60 fucking seven and seeing my ad? I don't. And don't even get me started with fucking Nielsen's. (laughs) It's a box in every 4,200 homes. That's horse shit. So, um, I want to know What's your what, name? Uh, Rick. What's up, Rick? So, I first saw you at, uh, at FOA yep. a couple years back. Thanks, man. Um, and I really like your passion about, you know, getting rid of this whole corporate bullshit and, like, you know, um, thinking, this whole mentality of thinking of the customer as, like, a number and, you know, how are we going to, you know, it's uh, coming, squeeze it out, you know? It's coming whether I talk about it or not because the fact of the matter is this platform is just exposing everything and it's just a matter of time. But totally. So, so what's, what's, how, how do you think it's going to be? You know, like, how do you see, you know, all, all what we're doing, because a lot of the people in this room are responsible, you know, and it's great to be a part of this, because they're responsible for helping, you know, um, the people with the ideas and the people who really want to connect with their customers to really do it, you know? Yeah. So where do you see it in, like, a couple years? And Well, I think it's like everything else, right? Like, the reason I believe in all this so much is we've just lived through the big box store era, right? Like, if you study business, it's always this. You know, you have build up, push back, counterculture. We're going through a huge age of information right now, right? Well, guess what's coming next? Restrictions. If you're in the filtering and restriction and aggregating business, you're gonna do quite well, right? Because that's just the yin and the yang. You know, I'm bullish on privacy. You know, like, that's just the way shit goes. You just go countercultural. We just lived through the big box retail era. We just, we're living through a great golden era for Amazon. Here's what I know. It's gonna push back to the mom and pop mentality. It makes my heart sing. Like, what is it singing? Like, Millie Vanilli. My heart is singing Millie Vanilli <laughs> right now. Blame it on the rain. You know why? Because the rain don't mind. But, and the rain don't care. But anyway, my heart is singing because I know, the, I said the other day, and it's really stuck in my head, I almost, decided, almost made it the subtitle of the Thank You Economy. I literally believe that your grandparents and your great-grandparents right now are more positioned, are more properly positioned to be successful in 2012 and beyond than we are because the way they built their businesses was they gave a fuck. That's how we have a baker's dozen. They gave 13. Go to fucking Whole Foods and pick up 13 donuts. Tell me if they're gonna charge you for 12. They're not. And they cared, you know why? Because they lived under small town rules. Whenever, you know, the old mom and pop game, you had to do the right thing as the butcher because if Mrs. Sally Sanderson had a bad experience, she was telling everybody else and it was all localized. Then we got fragmented. Well, all this shit, all you fucking, you guys are so fucking smart and building all this awesome shit. Do you know what you're doing? You're bringing us back to small town rules. We are going to the golden era of small town rules because we're more connected than ever. We have more relationships. Word of mouth is on fucking steroids. It's Barry Bonds, it's Roger Clemens, it's all that. And and that changes the complete dynamic of branding, brand perception. Look at what happened with that at t dude, right? He calls, you know, he emails the CEO, they give him the cease and desist, he puts out the voicemail out there and everybody jumps on and at t like, oh fuck, you know? I mean, this is gonna happen a lot. Meanwhile, I love transparency, you know why? Look at the perfect game in baseball, right? right. The ump blows the shit out of the call, right? You know, 10 years ago, he would have had one quote in the paper, he would have had so little chance to actually do anything. Meanwhile, he did all the right things and now it's become a good thing because he did the right thing. You know, he, he, you know I, I just, I find this amazing. I think it's gonna go, it'll go far, but then back to that point, because I, I thought that was a good one, the guy with the hammer, but a D or a T, that guy, he's awesome. <laughs> I gotta go apologize because I didn't catch it, I'm sorry, man. But that guy, I think he's going to an interesting point because what I think is gonna happen is, right now it's gonna be not authentic, so the authentic people are gonna win, right? The authentic people will win, everybody's gonna be like, oh fuck, you gotta be authentic? Fine, fuck it. So people will become authentic, and then we'll have this huge wave of like, when you check in to a stadium, you get 800 deals, and so so then you'll go back the other way. It's literally the up and down and as long as we recognize that you want to be going in the other direction, that when everything's going this way, that you're going that way, there's a lot of victories in that. Especially and most importantly if you're doing it from your heart, not because it's a tactical move. Totally. By the way, go Dolphins. Fuck that. <laughs> I like the Ravens more than Dolphins. Hey bro. 
Hey, Gary, my name is Miles. Uh, hey, Miles. I knew I was not going to have any other opportunity to thank you. Uh, I just have a little thing. Uh, a while ago, you and Jason Fried did a thing where you, if you bought both your books, yes. you did a three-hour thing. So I did that. I bought mainly because I wanted uh, the rework. Jason's book, I get Jason's it. Jason's book, I'm sorry. <laughs> But anyway, I ended up getting... DHH's book, really. Come on. <laughs> I ended up uh, getting... I, I, I really just... I don't have a question. Yeah, Crusher was I like a throw it, right? What's that? He wanted the three hours of free in his book. I, I Crusher did. was kind of like I this did. bullshit well, ad. It's like... It was like an infomercial. It's like, and if you call now, you'll get seven more knives. I was like, the seven more knives? <laughs> I respect that. I'm sorry. Well, no, no, I respect that. Both of those guys listen, are dramatically Gary. smarter than me, so you made the right call. Well, w what happened, Gary, is that you spent a little bit of time with me talking afterwards and I ended up uh, reading Oh, the your... day when we did the three hour talk and then Freed left and then I stayed on for like another hour and made fun of him? Freed? Yeah, yeah, that was Freed. awesome. So I took what you said, I read your book, I ended up starting a little podcast called Coder Path and uh, recently I uh, couldn't make it to RailsConf and uh, I put out just a little thing asking people if they'd support me and uh, I ended up in three days raising like 800 bucks to get here so I got here based on the the, just the amazingness of the Ruby community. And it really, a lot of it came from, you know, you just learning how to say thanks, and, and I really, really appreciate thanks, you man. kind of putting me on that path, because uh, now I've got to the little, I, I want to write each and every person who donated, and just a handwritten thank you. That's the game, man. So, Can you come up here for a sec? Yeah, sure. I just want to hug this the fuck out. <laughs> Is that all right? I'm okay with that, right? Thanks, man. That's awesome, man. <laughs> yes! <laughs> How are you gonna top that? <laughs> Cowboys fan? <laughs> yeah, uh, at least it's NFC. It doesn't bother me much. Go ahead. Uh, so, how do you get outside of baseball? How do you uh, uh, get outside of the vicious cycle of the yeah. tech press? You know, I have a big advantage. I'm already naturally outside of baseball, right? I built a big business, and you know, I'm a salesman. Like, you know, ironically, like, ironically, I'm, I'm pretty liked in the space. I'm very flattered for that, especially if people get to know me, right? And it's so funny because when I really got in the space, I was so businessy that, like, Castro was like, you're gonna fucking be hated. You know, he's like, you know, because that's where I come from. But I think if you're honest and you, you just tell it like it is and you feel like, I feel like, I feel like I started here in the space, you know, it was very tea and rock climbing in 06, you know? Still is a little bit, but it's a little bit more like this. I think I came here, you know what I mean? But just genetically, I'm outside of baseball. It, I do a lot of things outside of baseball. For every conference, and I go to the meetups, and I love all this stuff, and I, nobody reads more hacker news than me, and I love all that stuff, right? I still have a lot of friends that are very outside the space. You know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I do, I'm, you know, first of all, I'm gonna go to jail very shortly. Literally, I go to Central Park in New York and like watch like 13 year olds. I know I'm going to jail. <laughs> but I watch their habits. I, you know, it's something I enjoy. I love our culture. I love it with all my heart, right? I hear Glee is starting to make people pay attention, then I fucking watch Glee until my face falls off, right? You know, like, I wanna know what makes people tick, and so it's something I enjoy so much. Like, literally what I wanna do is be outside of baseball and then talk to our space, because I think that's a very positive way to look at it. So, I think you have to make a conscious effort, you know, and I think that people need to think about some of their outside interests, and I think it's awareness. I think if you want to be outside of baseball, when you're out there in the world, when you're at a baseball game, you know, just watch what people are doing. I mean, you know, it's very fascinating. So if, if you get dinged by someone in the tech press, do you just, just brush it off or try and talk to it? Yeah, so you mean like razzed? Like if Arrington is like, yeah. Gary Vee's an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that I very much respect why, listen, I'm very loud, I, I think in sound bites, I often rarely show my cards. You know, I talk very general when I do this. You know, I don't, I, I believe so much in up here, but I'm very good at down here, right? You know, I think, I think that, um, I, I think I respect why people would think that. I get okay. it. And so when they do, I have to take that medicine, but I also know that who I am, I know who my parents raised, I know who I want to be in this society, and I know that nobody, and it's just the way it is, I don't care what you think, nobody is trying harder to scale every relationship he or she has an opportunity more than me. I'm staying up to three o'clock in the morning, bleeding out of my eyeballs, answering email. I came down here just now on the Amtrak, did email, 
came here, talk, little hug, on my way back, answering email. Like that's, I, I want this. I, I love people, so it was built for me. This is timing, and so I respect it, I engage it, I love debating it, because I know, you know, I know where I come from, and you know, it's fun, because anybody can say, well, he's this and he's that, you know, it depends on where the conversation is, but I can always play a lot of good cards, right? You know, it's like Jay-Z said, men lie, women lie, numbers don't lie. You know, at the end of the day, if you do it, you do it. And in this new world, for every person that tweets tomorrow, at Gary Vee, you've changed, you think you're a celebrity now, you didn't respond to my email, 97 people come right behind that and say, he just emailed me five minutes ago. So, the truth is undefeated. Great, thanks. Sure, man. You rocked, extending the time. Yes, <laughs> appreciate it. Hi there, my name's Michael. Hey, Michael. Um, I had no idea who you were before this talk, and it's been actually awesome listening to you. Thanks, man. But I have a question. Um, sure. You said you're doing consulting for big firms. Yes. I've got this viewpoint that any time a customer complains to me, it's yes. like the most awesome gift they could possibly give me because then it gives me an ability to improve something that I had no, update, no idea about. You and I should kiss. <laughs> Come on, go. I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk shit, but this side is dominating your ass. All right, go ahead. So go anyway, ahead. as I was saying, can I tell you something funny? Yeah, well, man. I just told a client that has been kind of doing their shit so right for the last six months. I walked in to like they get me like once you know, for two hours a month kind of thing. I walked in and I said, all right, everything's going great. I really like it. I can't believe, holy shit, you guys have changed. This is great. This is going to be good. I need to keep pounding this. Let's now go into other parts of the company and create the culture, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, all right, great. What should we do next? I'm like, all right, you ready for this? I wasn't joking. I was like, I think I want to do something wrong on purpose so we can say we're sorry. Exactly. So like, I'm with you, man. I like, I pitched... <laughs> I pitched a client to do something wrong on purpose. Nice. That's how much I love, you know, having the opportunity to address something wrong. <laughs> no. No, it wasn't. Thank God. That, that, that question was, that was, was almost was the end of my BP? career. Yes, I created the oil spill. So my question is, how do you find that going in the in like the big corporate? Because there's this, this whole bullshit idea of you have to manage complaints. It's and going that, bad. Yeah, because they exactly. play a different game. You know why? Because every CEO of every major company in the world doesn't have a 20-year thought process. Right. The game is broken. They want to be there for three or four years. They need to keep the stock price at a certain point, cash out, and be out. So how the fuck do you expect them to build on what I'm calling a relationship platform? You don't build real relationships in two years. This is all forever. Right? Think about how you, think about this. Think about how you and I feel about each other right now in comparison to an hour ago, right? We've kissed, you know. Uh, I, you know I do want to say one thing. But, but, but here's no what time. I know. Right. You and I feel differently about each other. The, when, when I was in Chicago and I broke my iPhone and DHH and Fried and I went to the Apple store and bought an iPhone, I got to spend that quality hour time and I felt differently about him, admiring his work, but I had that hour. And then when I saw him in the hall, I've already off a different level, right? I already feel, I mean, you know, the emotions of that day, which was so awesome, come in, and it becomes this whole thing. When Freed and I took a flight back from Big Omaha the other day, you know, we were basically making out in the seats. It was disgusting. <laughs> you know, that's how in love with him I am. And, and so you slow, but then it's Are not you just doing these, anything By dinner? the way, by the way, I'm being a dick face right now. I'm dropping rock star names. Fuck those guys. Uh, well, how about us, right? The next time I see you, it's gonna be a different thing. I'm gonna be like, dude, remember when we kissed yes. in Baltimore? <laughs> And everybody's gonna be like, what the fuck? And then we'll How be like, could yeah. I you know, so I, listen, it's going difficult because the corporate game is built not to do this. Right. However, I believe that I will get lucky, maybe, probably not, but either, you know, the, probably not, because, you know, client work and consulting work is difficult. I did it for a very strong purpose. I very much believe that too many people in this space don't do enough things to learn. I need to taste shit. You know, how are you supposed to know unless you taste it? And I think a lot of people in our space know what they're good at, but they stick to what they know, and they don't do things. You know, maybe you should throw a lemonade stand one Saturday. You taste different dynamics. It's very funny what happens. And I wanted to understand corporate DNA. I wanted to understand the you know, brand managers. I wanted to understand CMOs. And so, even though on paper it looks silly, and all my intellectual big thinking friends that have all these big companies probably looked at it like, oh, fucking Gary made the short play. 
I made the right play. I'm telling you I made the right play. It's not fun. I feel like I'm rocky and got the log on my fucking back and doing the snow shit, but I'm learning so much. Remember the wheelbarrow? You know what I'm talking about. And so, <laughs> but I'm learning so much and it's gonna allow me to power broke and, and I'm bringing Campbell's, you know, bringing Pepsi together with sticky bits like I just did. That's interesting stuff for me. That happened because of me. That feels good. You know, I feel like I'm pushing the envelope and there's only one way to do it. You gotta speak their language. And I wanted to taste that shit. I wanted to taste it. Whether it's sour or sweet, I wanna do it. I wanna get my hands dirty. I even tried to figure out code, but you guys are way too smart for me. Awesome, thanks. Thanks, man. Great, thank you. My name is Craig. Um, hey, Craig. First uh, comment, I think, is reminds me some of what you're saying. The, think, uh, the native elders talk about thinking down the seven generations. And that's something I think that we could probably learn about from the Western culture. You know what's funny about that note? I'm addicted to old people. As they, like, you should see, so I travel a lot, hopefully less now. I have a one-year-old, mm -hmm. so I'm trying to cut down. This is like mm -hmm. one of my last talks, actually, for a while. But I switch seats on airplanes all the time. If somebody looks like Yoda, I'm sitting next to them. <laughs> <laughs> like, like the amount of conversations that I've had with 80 and 90 year old strangers, I guarantee is at the tippy top of the world right now. You know why? They've played the game. And you know what they've told me? Every one of them? Not one of them gave a fuck how much money they made. Whether they were rich or poor. Every one of them says the same shit. Gary, I wish I spent more time with my family and I wish I did something I loved. And I don't understand how we know this. And these are the people that played our game. The real game. Fuck the bullshit. The real game. Mm -hmm. and how we don't take that into account. Yeah, and the, the question or, or issue I want to address, you're talking about the freemium model now, if you have like a community and you have the paid and unpaid members, and how do you get and engage those who are not the paid members to not feel second class or secondary to the, those who are paid since they don't have access perhaps to everything? And listen, this comes down to the DNA of the person whose platform it is, right? I can very much understand why somebody would have a tough time between, I, I have. I mean, I many times said to myself, huh, 100,000 people a day watching Wine Library TV, 30 minutes a day. You know, I, I very much wanted to be the first video blogger to really go there and really charge, right? Mm -hmm. Really go to 99 cents a month. You know, and then I was like, well, but then, you know, I don't want to go all the way there, so I'll go to that freemium. I'll do Monday and Tuesday, you know, free, and then Wednesday and Thursday. And you have all these internal debates inside. Here's what I mean, though. What makes right now different and why I'm talking about it out loud not inside myself, like I've been for the last five years, is the culture's being formed. There's being a, a different acceptance to actually paying for things, and I think collectively, when it's bigger than you, and it becomes the umbrella of the culture, it allows you to kind of go that way a little bit easier. And so that's what's fascinating me. Uh, directly to answer that question, I think you coddle those relationships one by one. You make, you know, you've gotta come from an honest place. Nobody's ever been confused. I wanna buy the New York Jets, right? <laughs> I'd love to think I could win that on kissing dudes' faces, but I can't. I need to make a couple bucks. And so, you know, it's, it, there's nothing wrong with building a business and charging. I know it's difficult, you know, depending on your DNA, but I think mm -hmm. when, you, when you've spent time building extra features or whatever it may be, or doing extra to create this, you know, I think it's acceptable, especially, mm -hmm. and most importantly, if you respect, listen, and care for the people that are not the paying customers. Okay, all right, well thank you. Sure, man. Hey Gary, I'm Edward. Hey Edward. I'm in Ottawa these days, and nice. I think we met in Orlando, and I was like, hey, mobile payments are gonna be the shit, they're gonna be amazing. Yeah, but I invested in Venmo, so I agree. I've changed my mind. Okay, fuck. I think open data <coughs> is gonna be amazing. What did you think? Open data, you heard uh -huh. about this? It's like when municipalities and cities and countries yep. say, here's all our data, and uh, I'm thinking like, if you get things like food inspection reports, the actual data's boring, but now you know where every single restaurant is in the city by law, and I wanna know, where you think that's gonna go and like, I think it's gonna be huge. I think that there's a ton of money to be made. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I, and I, I think countries are gonna want you to do this. I think that this is a, a space that I haven't done enough thinking on. I think it's a perfect example of something I believe in, which is, in general, I need to, the reason I'm not gonna be speaking as much anymore is I, I think it's time for me to shut the fuck up for a little bit. I've been talking for quite a while and I think it's time for me to do, and this is a perfect example, I'm aware of it, but I've done absolutely no homework to really give a true answer, right? So I can't answer you and that's because I've been spending too much time speaking and not enough time thinking and looking and so the real answer is I haven't given it a, a real thought yet and so right. I can't truly answer you. But I think my intuition's like, hmm, you know? I've got them, hmm. Remember that song, Things That Make You Go, hmm? Yeah. No, sorry. Uh, yeah, it was good. Um, was that CNC Music Factory? Yeah. Fuck yeah. Cool. All right, <laughs> thanks man. So, you know, 
I'll get, you know what? Send me an email to Gary at VaynerMedia.com and I'll send you an answer in a week. Sweet. Hey, man. Hey, Gary. My name's Jay. Hey, Shay. Jay. Jay. Fuck, sorry. No, I thought problem. you were Met Stadium. Yeah. <laughs> um, you talk about, you know, more mom and pop kind of going in that direction. Yeah. Um, mom and pop skill sets. Sure. And you're also talking about uh, dealing with large corporations, trying to get them to understand um, you, but you made a comment earlier about how with Hawaiian Library you couldn't ship to like Boston because yeah. you know they're so puritanical and right or Maryland, big, you know, right? How do you kind of attack that vein of like there's these conglomerates or you mean like you know, the liquor wholesalers yeah, that pay off politicians for not allowing me to ship yeah. here? Yeah, how does that fit into the equation for you? You know, I have this deep, dark, secret thought that I'm going to build this trillion-dollar company and then go after the families of everybody who was involved in the liquor wholesale business. <laughs> Yes, I'll help. <laughs> so that's pretty much the answer. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's unfortunate. I would have loved to stick and fight that fight. Sure. And I'm a big voice and I could have helped it. But unfortunately, the liquor retailers are so fragmented and most of them think small and they're more worried about wine library shipping in. They're, it's the same old game. They're thinking of the downside instead of the upside. It's not different than corporations that tell me, we don't want to open this up because people could say our product's bad. Well, how about all the communication and all the good? And so unfortunately, most of us, a lot of us are wired in a way where we look at the negative more so than positive. For example, and I know I gotta leave, it looks like in a second. Rap, please, I get it. You're not gonna give me another I'm so awesome, you got five more minutes? Yeah, yeah nice. <laughs> um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that I lost my train of thought, but I'll catch it in a second. Give me one second. Um, that the, the shift is here, and, and people need to look at the positives. I, for one, am blown away on how poorly human beings are branded. I think we are dramatically underestimated and ridiculously uh, mispositioned. I think we are so much better than we give each other credit for. People focus on the negatives. It's really the shark and hippo thing, right? Sharks, those poor fuckers, they are so brandly poured, excuse me, so poorly branded. You know, everybody's scared of them because fucking Spielberg and all that shit, and everybody's scared of them, right? Meanwhile, hippos, we love them. Hungry, hungry hippos, awesome. Meanwhile, those fuckers kill way more people than sharks. Right. <laughs> it's true, and I kind of think about humans that way. When I hear things like, oh, don't check into places because people are going to rob your house. Fuck you, who's gonna rob my house? You know, the, you know I mean, it, the numbers are so much smaller, the bad things are so much smaller than all the good that's happening in all our interactions. We are dramatically being underappreciated. Team humans. <laughs> Thanks. Hi Gary, my name is Michael. Wow, hey Michael. this is loud. Um, just, just as a brief aside, we start with a hug, we move to a kiss. Trying to extrapolate a trajectory leaves me vaguely you want some of this? about where this is going. <laughs> if you like my question, so... Uh... Seven minutes in heaven? You ready? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a computer nerd. Uh, I don't really have much connection with uh, business people. In fact, I'm, you know, I think you a hate lot him. of us... Exactly. Yeah. We're used to thinking of them as the enemy, sure. in a way. But I really like what you're saying, that a lot of business people There's like have one or two of us. That's what I was exactly about to ask. You, you just nailed it. No, I, I don't, I, I'd love to think that, but there's more good than bad. Listen, th listen, business people are wired in a way that it, they're very, you know, they're analytics driven too, right? They want to make it, you know, here's what's cool. Nobody was more businessy, business, business, Ben than me, right? I would fucking, you know, my early, early days, I hate to say it, but I would have told you anything about that Pinot Noir to make sure you bought a case, right? I mean, just, you know, that raw business ethics. But you know what? Because of people, can you guys do me a favor because I love him so fucking much? Seriously, if you are on Twitter right now, can you please add Kastner something? Let's, give, let's do the same thing. Like, at Kastner, your face is beautiful. <laughs> if, you know, I, I owe him so much because, you know, when I think about this, he came in working with me and it was after 9-11, so it was a tough time, so that's why he probably had to work for less money than he deserved at a liquor store for a very businessy guy, even though he was a very, but he's just the best dude, and he helped me look at the world in a different way, and do, am I anywhere close to where he looks at the world? I'm not, but allow me to look at different things, and I think for you, if we spent a weekend together, man, seven minutes in heaven, now I'm taking, you know, I move fast, bro. Um, <laughs> that I think you would look at it differently because it's, it's, you know, it's gonna, it's one of these great, it's gonna happen anyway. There's gonna be commerce, right? And there's good ways to go about it and there's bad ways. And I think in general, the space that you're all part of, you're gonna be very, very proud. You guys, 
it makes me so happy to know, and I mean it, and this, there's such a good vibe in this room for me in my heart, that the people in this conference today, the people sitting right in front of me, you're gonna be really feeling good about yourself in 50, 60 years sitting there you know, on the lake fishing. You're gonna be like, I was a part of something in a very early stages that really, really, really means something. This is, once again, because I think we're so bad at branding and understanding where things go, this is so much bigger than we understand and um, it's gonna feel nice that we were a part of it. Well, thank you. Sure, man. Last one. Hey, Gary. Hey, bro. Uh, Mike. Mike, what's up? So, yeah, I, I really appreciate all your insights into the business and change and how things are moving there. Um, but I'm curious about what your thoughts are on social change, yeah. sort of outside the business realm, and sure. uh, w what you see developing and what your interest in that is. Yeah, so this is funny. I was telling somebody a story yesterday. I actually showed somebody my tax report the other day because they called me out and said, why didn't you tweet about Haiti or this and that? And back to that rant I gave you earlier about 100 fans and this and that, for all my bravado and all my promotion and all my in-your-face stuff, I'm very weird about charity and social stuff. I feel like... It's the wrong thing. You know, it's so, I'm a backwards dude in a lot of ways, right? Like, a lot of people don't feel like you should talk about your business stuff or selling, but you talk about that stuff. I, in a weird way, I'm the reverse. And literally, this guy was like, I invited him to Starbucks and showed him my tax return and said, now what, fucker? You know? And so that felt good. I, I think there's a lot of good things going on in that. I have gotten somewhat active with Charity Water. You know, Scott, here's what I think. I think we're about to be in the golden era of it. You know why? Because I think because of the platform, the internet and just the space and because guys like me, because influenced by guys like Kastner and other people moved more this way, a lot of charity and a lot of social things are gonna start looking a lot more like business because in the past they've been run by people that aren't business people. And the reason Charity Water is dominating is because Scott Harrison was a club promoter, entrepreneur through and through, so he understands. And so I feel like we're about to go through a golden era because business people are gonna be making these charity decisions, not just being on the board for an hour once a month, but actually running them and, and impacting them. And I think socially, I also think just the transparency that we're living in socially is creating enormous gifts and opportunity. I just think we're all gonna have to live a better world. Think about how dads have been rebranded. Do you guys recognize that golf industry is down? Do you know why? Forget the Tiger Woods stuff. I mean, globally, it's been tracking down. The golf business is soft. You know why? Spending dads. time with your kids. Because dads are different. You got it, buddy. Because 72, me, I'm golfing on Saturday doing business. Now, me and Misha are in the park. And so, I, you know, I'm a bit, you know, I'm all in. I'm bullish on human beings. And I think this platform, again, not fucking Facebook or Ustream, the internet, the web, whatever you want to call it, has created one of the great opportunities for, and listen, there'll be bad things, I get it, and one day somebody will hijack and the whole thing will shut down and we're all dead or whatever. I understand. I get it. You know, net neutrality, I get it. Fucking aliens, I get it. Do I think robots win? Yes, but we won't see it. But so, I get all that, but here's what I know. We should be thankful as fuck because I think we've got a good era. Yeah, man. Thank, Thank you guys so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much.